Picture this. It's the 1940s. A little black boy screams from his hospital bed, his joints locked with pain, his breathing shallow. His mother clutches his hand. The nurse rolls her eyes. He's faking, she says. It's just growing pains. But it isn't. It's a sickle cell crisis. His blood cells are shaped like knives. They're clogging his veins, starving his organs of oxygen. And no one, not the staff, not the textbooks, not the government, cares. No one, that is, except a quiet, determined black doctor down the hall at Howard University. His name is Dr. Roland B. Scott, and he's about to dedicate his entire life to proving that this pain is real. Scope News presents a deep dive into the legacy of Dr. Roland B. Scott, the father of sickle cell research, and how racism tried to bury both him and the disease. Roland Scott was born in 1909 in Alabama, brilliant and ambitious, but black. He was rejected from several white medical schools simply for the color of his skin. He finally enrolled at Howard University, earned his medical degree, and by 1939 passed the American Board of Pediatrics examination. After training in Chicago, he returned to Howard as a full-time assistant professor, earning just $3,000 a year, barely enough to support his wife and child. That same year, he and fellow black doctor Alonzo Smith applied to the American Academy of Pediatrics. They were rejected because of race. They applied again and were accepted. Dr. Scott later became the first black physician in the American Pediatric Society and the Society for Pediatric Research. But while James Herrick, a white doctor, was publicly credited with discovering sickle cell in 1910, it was Dr. Scott who actually built the field. He didn't just observe the disease, he studied it, documented it, fought to have it recognized. In an era when most physicians dismissed sickle cell as a Negro condition not worth funding, Scott was publishing research and testifying before Congress. And yet he remained invisible. Sickle cell anemia is inherited. It contorts red blood cells into crescent shapes, causing fatigue, organ failure, and unbearable pain. The crises come without warning. It feels like your bones are splitting. Your chest tightens, your legs go cold, you can't breathe, you want to scream, but most of the time no one listens. And when black people do show up to emergency rooms mid-crisis, many are told they're just seeking drugs, even children, even elders, even repeat patients. Instead of morphine, they're handed judgment. The pain is dismissed. The tears are ignored. Their crisis is mistaken for addiction. This isn't just a medical issue. It's a cultural crisis, one that has taken the lives of celebrities and everyday people alike. Some have passed on. Others are still fighting, living day to day with a pain few can comprehend. They don't always make the headlines. But they carry the same weight, battle the same disease, and often suffer in the same silence. And for many black celebrities, artists, performers, and icons, sickle cell wasn't just a diagnosis. It was a hidden shadow, a backstage crisis, a tour bus collapse. They smiled through photo ops while their blood betrayed them. They kept singing, rapping, dancing, acting, while their bodies broke down in silence. Some of the most talented black performers carried this disease with them, often in secret, often dismissed, and almost always misunderstood. Their pain didn't make headlines. Their deaths weren't treated as medical warnings. But their stories reveal just how deep this disease cuts and how little support they received when the cameras were off. Paul Williams from The Temptations was born in the 1930s. Imagine living through the rise of Motown while hiding a disease that was literally breaking your body down. Paul danced with synchronized elegance, sang with soul, and smiled through photo shoots, while secretly enduring agony most people couldn't imagine. There were no opioids, no advocates, no one who understood what he was going through. He likely felt isolated, misunderstood, ashamed. There were no hashtags, no awareness campaigns, just pain and silence. According to reporting from soulmusic.com, Paul had a long history of emotional struggles and physical pain, and the burden eventually overtook him. He died by suicide in 1973. His legacy lives on, but the story of his illness remains a footnote. Prodigy from Mob Deep spoke openly about his disease. He rapped, I got you stuck off the realness, and he meant it. He was hospitalized constantly. The pain shaped his music. 
He died in 2017, not from a crisis, but from choking on an egg in a hospital bed while recovering from one. T-Boz of TLC has not only survived sickle cell, she's fought for others living with it. Doctors told her she wouldn't live past 30, that she would never have children, and that she could never be an entertainer. She proved them all wrong. At the height of TLC's fame, while touring the world, she was enduring full-blown crises in silence, sometimes passing out on the tour bus, sometimes collapsing backstage while the crowd chanted her name. Through it all, she kept performing, kept pushing, and when her fame gave her a platform, she used it. T-Boz has continued to speak publicly about the stigma, the discrimination in healthcare, and the loneliness of the disease. She is more than a survivor. She's a voice for every child who's been told their pain isn't real. And what's worse? The research has always been underfunded. In 2022, cystic fibrosis, a condition that affects mostly white children, received over $100 million in federal research funding. Sickle cell, just 16 million. This is not about numbers. It's about race. The suffering is black. The funding is white. Dr. Scott pushed for federal recognition. And in 1971, the U.S. government finally passed the Sickle Cell Anemia Control Act, thanks in large part to his persistence. But that was more than 30 years after Scott began his fight. Three decades of children dying, three decades of silence. Even today, the disease is seen as a black issue, not a national emergency. But science is catching up. In the United Kingdom, a 12-year-old black boy was cured of sickle cell using CRISPR gene editing. And on December 17, 2024, a young man named Sebastian Bozel, just 21 years old, became the first patient in New York to be cured of sickle cell anemia using a groundbreaking gene therapy, levotibaglogin auto -tem cell. He's been symptom-free ever since. These miracles stand on the shoulders of Dr. Roland B. Scott. Sickle cell isn't new. It has African origins, an evolutionary response to malaria. It traveled through the transatlantic slave trade and rooted itself in the descendants of enslaved people. For centuries, this painful legacy has been dismissed, racialized, and underdiagnosed. But Dr. Scott saw what others refused to see, that the pain was real, that black children deserved care. That research should follow suffering, not whiteness. He is now widely recognized as the father of sickle cell research. Though his name still isn't known like Salk or Lasker or Herrick, he gave his life to this disease and the country barely acknowledged it. But we do. Scope News tells the truth. Here are the facts. This report was created using documents from the Howard University Medical Archives, Carl Pochidley's History of Black Pediatricians, data from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and reports from the National Institutes of Health on sickle cell treatment and funding. Information about the December 17, 2024, gene therapy cure was sourced from Bluebird Bio Inc. The UK gene editing breakthrough was covered by BBC News. Prodigy statements were drawn from interviews and lyrics. Reporting on Paul Williams' life and illness includes the article Motown Spotlight, Paul Williams, Temptations, from soulmusic.com. Tion T. Boz. Watkins' experiences are sourced from her public interviews and advocacy campaigns, including her work with the Sickle Cell Disease Association of America. Legal disclaimer. This content is for educational, informational, and entertainment purposes. Scope News makes every effort to ensure factual accuracy based on publicly available records and historical documentation. However, some details may reflect incomplete archives or editorial interpretation. Viewer discretion is advised when engaging with sensitive content related to race, illness, and suicide. This report is not intended as medical advice and should not replace consultation with a licensed healthcare provider.